Hello everyone and welcome to this week's book club. I am so excited to be joined by the amazing, the wonderful Jenny Lee, the writer of Anna Kay. Um, so for those of you who are thinking book club, there's a book club, what's a book club? Um, this is the Platform YA book club. We have been running it for, uh, this is our third week and we've got one more week. Uh, next week, we've been reading a book a week and at the end of every week on Sunday, we have talked to the author of that book in a QA and a where we ask some questions, you ask some questions. It's been a good time. Um, so if you want to get involved uh, for next week, there are four different ways. One, you've already done read the book, join the live stream. Congratulations, tick. Uh, the second one is using the hashtag, hashtag platform YA book club on social media um, as you read to share your thoughts, um, to ask the author's questions and to meet fellow readers. Plus anytime you use the hashtag on social, you are entered into the weekly book bundle giveaway. Uh, you can also join our Discord community uh, to connect with other readers. A link to that is in the description. And also if you're a book creator, maybe you have a, a book Instagram or TikTok or YouTube channel, we would love to see anything that you're doing around the book club. So link it, link us, you know, DM us. Uh, we would love to see what you're doing and, and share your work. Um, so as I said today, I'm going to be talking to Jenny, uh, asking some of my own Hi, questions. Uh, and also some questions that you have already submitted. But uh, if you have any questions during the stream, put them in the live chat because my wonderful colleague, Simon, is gonna be compiling them all for me in a document and we are going to uh, come to those as soon as possible. Um, we also know that some of you may not have finished the book yet and we don't wanna spoil for you. So we're going to have a spoiler section of the live stream at the very end of the stream, uh, which I will I will tell you that there will be spoilers. I will warn you, it will not come as a surprise. Um, but it means that if you haven't quite finished, you can pause the video, finish reading, and then come back and watch that kind of spoiler section. So without further ado, we are going to get to the questions. So um, I wanna go all the way back now, Jenny, to when you very first started writing. Were okay. you you know, a kid who wrote books every weekend? Were you doing a lot of writing when you were younger? Or I I was definitely one of those kids who always wanted to be a writer. Like I remember, it's funny, I remember that first story, like a Halloween story on the paper that you learned to write cursive on, which I guess kids aren't learning cursive anymore in the United States. But that little with the dotted line, I remember doing like, it was like a black kitten in a Halloween, in a jack-o'-lantern, in a Halloween pumpkin like that. I remember very clearly that being my first story, but I've always... I don't know. I just love stories. I love reading. Um, it was a good escape for me, I think, as a kid. Uh, I would My mom would dump me off at the library a lot. So I just always wanted to do that. I mean, my parents didn't want me to do that, to be a writer, but I always wanted to. That was my plan. I mean, how has your journey as a writer gotten? Because you, you didn't kind of go from wanting to write novels as a kid to writing them straight away, right? You've done other writing stuff in between. Can you, can you talk about yes. that a bit? Sure. Um, it's been a very circuitous past. So basically I did go to NYU, Tisch Dramatic Writing uh, School of the Arts. But honestly, when I applied, because I grew up in Tennessee, a very small town, I really didn't even understand what dramatic writing was, which is for writing for plays or TV and movies. But I had won a writing contest um, in high school and they contacted me and like, hey, apply to this school. And I secretly applied to art school knowing my parents did not want me to go. My mom knew, but my dad did not. And then I got in early and I was like, this is where I'm gonna go to school. And my dad's like over my dead body. And then basically we had a standoff and I'm like, I'm not applying anywhere else. It's cause I got in, I hadn't put in any other applications and I'm like, I'm not gonna go to college. So we had a whole thing about it. And basically at the end, he like broke down. He's like, fine, you can go, but we're just gonna drop you off. I had never been to New York city before. So they just popped up in a cab, like in front of my dorm and then left basically. And so then after school, like I did an English major and I was doing dramatic writing. It's funny because I didn't actually finish Tish because I didn't want to write for TV. You know, I wanted to write plays a little bit, but I really was more interested in prose. And then now it's funny because however many, you know, 20 years later, I'm basically writing TV is my main thing. And books are kind of like my side hustle for now. Um, so we've had a question, I'll do our first question from someone else. This is from 20 something, which I'm pretty sure was through the Discord. Um, they wanna know, why did you choose to retell Anna Karenina? What was it about that book that, that spoke to you? That, it's funny because, um, you know, I knew obviously there was a lot of retellings in Young Adult, but I never really thought about doing it myself. 
but Anna Karenina, I have always loved. I actually read it for the first time when I was 15, I had gotten grounded. And so I was stuck in my room with not much to do. And my sister who was in college at the time um, sent it to me because she was taking Russian lit and was like, here, read this book. You have a lot of time on your hands. So I loved it. And then I've always, I read it again in my twenties. And then when I saw that Keira Knightley version, the Joe Wright version of Anna Karenina with Keira Knightley, and um, I was in New York, York City, it was a ton, and I walked out of that movie and I was like, oh, it's so beautiful. And like being in New York City, I was just like, oh my gosh, this would be such a great young adult novel because it really, Anna Karenina really does talk about the first time you're in love, like majorly in love. Because yes, Anna Karenina in the original was married, but she just really hadn't experienced like true passionate love before until she met Count Bronsky. And so it's just like a very romantic ideal to me. So then I, I don't know, I couldn't sleep that night. I was at a hotel um, and then I like snuck down to the lobby because my mom was sleeping <laughs> and I just kind of thought of it. And I emailed uh, my book agent and I was like, hey, what about this for a young adult novel? And she's like, oh my God, I'd love it. Do it. And that was 2012. But honestly, I didn't even start really writing it till like early 2017. How, how come there was such a gap? Was it just because you were busy or you were trying to figure out what it would look like to make it into a YA book? Like what, why that gap? I think the gap was honestly, I tried a couple different versions, but I felt a little obviously reticent where obviously you don't, no one needs to rewrite Tolstoy. It's one of the greatest novels of all time. So I'm like, who am I to think that I dare do <laughs> thing? Like, I mean, totally. I really was like such hubris or flying too close to the sun. So I was trying to, do different versions of it where it was like, you know, there'd be a whole side plot that was like in modern day and someone found a diary and it was like us telling the story of Anna Karenina. But as we all know, the original novel has so much story. It's like 800 pages and so many characters. It just never worked really because it was just too unwieldy. And it was actually through Game of Thrones how I figured out how to do it. Mm. <laughs> Game of Thrones is in the books or the TV show or like a mix of both in terms of the inspiration? A mix of both. I had like minor surgery and I had to like, I was laid up in bed for like a week basically on very good painkillers and I had not seen Game of Thrones. So this is right before the last season of Game of Thrones. So I hadn't watched it because I was one of the, I'm one of those people who was like, I want to read the book first, you know, but then I never had time to read the book because I was working on TV at the time. So then I watched Game of Thrones on Percocet and um, Soma, which is a muscle relaxant, which I can kind of recommend. It's a fun way to watch Game of Thrones because I was like, oh my gosh, look at these dragons. I was like so into it. But afterwards, I still had to like stay home for a while. And I started reading the books afterwards. And when I was reading it, I was like, I cannot believe how close, you know, book one is to the actual show. You know, and as a TV writer, I was like, oh my gosh, that's it. He wrote his chapters like they were seen. So I was like, that's what I need to do is use my TV experience of plotting out scenes in a TV show to write Anna Kay. And then it just came to me. It was like a breakthrough moment. I was like, oh my gosh, that's why I wrote very quick chapters. So when I was plotting it out, I was in my head, I was like, oh, that would be a good scene in a show. Mm -hmm. Like I was trying to picture it very visually. Um, you've mentioned in both the answers actually about New York, like both in your own life and, and obviously it being in, within the novel. So I wanted to actually take another question from Joanna has asked, what do you think this setting adds or changes to the story from the original setting? I, best, I guess both in terms of the modernity, but also New York as a city. You know, I, I actually arrived in New York at 18, right, for college. So I live in Los Angeles now, but I spent my entire 20s in New York City and I love the city. So there's very romantic aspect to that to me. But when I was thinking about the original, which takes place in Moscow and St. Petersburg, like her brother in the main action taking place in Moscow, but Anna was married and lived in St. Petersburg. And then you really need that iconic train scene because that's probably one of the most romantic scenes to me ever. So when I was thinking about it, seriously, on that first night, I was like, oh my God, it's perfect. I could do New York City as Moscow in Greenwich, Connecticut, who I had friends and obviously had been to. It's about an hour on the train. I was like, oh, then I can get the train through Metro North. So that was why. And I also just, I don't know, there is a lot of romance to me in the city. And as a teenager, you know, especially a wealthy teenager who does not have that much parental supervision, it just seems like if you have a lot of money when you're young, 
New York would be super fun. <laughs> I mean, I never had money when I was uh, in my 20s in New York. So, but I mean, you always kind of dream of it. Um, a similar question, but I think this is kind of interesting from 20 something. Um, what influenced the changes you made to the original story? Because I guess you can't really uh, it transpose the original directly onto modern day, right? Because you've got different things are happening, different uh, attitudes, different social structures, all this kind of stuff. How much of your thought process before you started even writing went into trying to figure out how you matched those different elements? Like what does someone who is this character in this Russian novel become when it's a, a modern teenager in, in the 21st century? Or did you sort of just start writing and then those elements of trying to match it up to the, the novel come afterwards? What was that like for you, that process? More the latter of what you just said. I basically just dove in because I really very quickly pictured that first scene to me about where Lolly, I mean, I don't think mm -hmm. this is a spoiler, it's the first chapter, where yeah. Lolly gets, uh, <laughs> where Lolly busts her boyfriend, who's Anna's brother, um, by um, his Apple Watch and finding out that like a little uh, sexy pic was shown. And so that's how she realized it. And that story came from when I was in a TV writer's room and we had a writer's assistant who found out, um, or her brother found out that his uh, wife was cheating on him because of an Apple watch. And I was like, oh my God, I just filed that away. And I was like, oh, that's really, yeah, <laughs> definitely. And so that was kind of, you know, the plan. I mean, so as I went, the part one of Anna Kay is very similar to the exact sort of plot of events in Anna Karenina. But I think by part two, I really deviate a lot. I mean, the same thing happens with Kimmy where her after like, the Vronsky upset, she gets a little bit heartbroken. And then, you know, instead of going to like a sanitarium and, you know, to recover, she actually ends up going um, to like a wellness spa to like, you know, to deal with like her depression. But that's where it really started to differentiate because Kimmy, that's a good example because with Kimmy, what I, it's very different from the original is that I wanted Kimmy as a young girl to have agency to be angry mm -hmm. and like to really get pissed off at like what had happened to her and like to really be able to like process it and also give her a voice where, you know, she gets to like have her, you know, say so later. So that was, I really very much wanted it to be very different for women, you know, in this book for young girls. Cause I just wanted to give them more the power where in the original, because it, it was written in the late 1800s, the women really did had no power at all. Cause that's what the tragedy was for me with the, you know, with the original is that it's just like, you know, it just says you can't fuck up ever. You know, you can't make any mistakes. And I'm just like, that's just not how it is in modern day. And especially shouldn't be when you're a teenager. Like you're, I made so many mistakes as a teenager, you know. I like love, love, love the image in that first scene of Lolly like locking herself in the wardrobe and Stephen like not knowing what's happening until there's just a picture of her just in a fur coat like ah oh, no and I just such it's just such an ex like a, a perfect capture of this um sort of elite upper New York echelons sort of characters that you're dealing with who are dealing with these really emotional awful things happening but are doing it in this like walk-in wardrobe room with like a fur coat very dramatically because of an apple watch like it's such a fun like interesting beginning and I think it tells you a lot about the characters from the very start I think without doing that doing the classic show don't tell uh thing that I'm sure everyone who is uh a writer an aspiring writer in the in the live stream will, will understand the idea of instead of you just saying she was extremely rich it's like oh how are we going to show this in the way that the characters behave and their attitudes in in what's described in the scene um and that was just such a clear image for me you talk about sort of tv writing and, and seeing it as scenes and i think um that came across for me and i know that in the discord everyone was talking about um how it felt very very filmic um and then someone pointed out who had then reached the end of the book and pointed out that you talk in your acknowledgements and you talk in that you're kind of uh, authors afterward that you do work in tv and suddenly everyone was like oh it makes sense like they <laughs> it up and they're like oh yeah that that totally makes sense yeah completely see it um so you took you a little while to get to get uh, into actually starting to write the story how long did the that first draft take was it kind of all out in a whirlwind or did it take some work to get through because it's obviously a very long long book for for being YA so it's it's a big undertaking I imagine. 
Right. The first draft was, you know, in Microsoft Word, when you write manuscript pages, it's double spaced, you know, 200 words per page, basically. And it was 529 pages. My technique, is, and I've since learned through Instagram, which I didn't know the terminology, it's called drafting that you just don't look, I mean, I've always kind of written that way, which is I just go forward and I'll clean up later. I do not like ache over any particular sentence or detail. I'm very big on being like, oh, X designer here, you know, put in X location there and I'll just keep going because I like know in my head and I'll go back to it because it just slows me down. I'm a very quick writer. I think also in TV, you sort of learn you don't get precious about your work. So, you know, if I have to throw something out and it's not working, I can completely stop and just change directions, throw out those three pages very quickly without even really looking at them. Just if I can't get to the end of a chapter and it's only four pages, something's wrong. So I'll just kind of can toss it and I kept going. I honestly probably drafted that in uh, like under two months, which I know sounds crazy, but I was still like after surgery trapped in my house and I really couldn't, you know, I couldn't do much. I couldn't, I have a very large Newfoundland dog. Like I actually own one, the same dog that Anna has. Um, 135 pounds. I looked it up. It's like 67 kilograms. <laughs> like she's a big girl. And so I couldn't even walk the dog at that point. Cause I just had to be careful. And so I was really just in bed on my laptop writing and I really didn't have much to do. So it actually like probably was my best writing experience of like divine, like coming down on me. But I also knew because I had, you know, lucky enough to have follow the original novel, I had plot points mm -hmm. and I already knew you know, obviously. So I knew how I was going to do it. So it was, it really made it go fast. So it was a great experience. But then after that, that was the painful part is obviously going back to revise those pages. Of course. Um, just a reminder to everyone who's watching, if you do want to ask any questions to Jenny about maybe you're an aspiring writer who wants to ask writing advice, maybe you've just read the book and you're dying to know about a particular character or her process, um, ask them in the live chat and we will get to them ASAP. Um, so I guess that's that's the question then. What what changed from that first draft? Was there anything that you had to get rid of that you really wish you could have held on to, or do you feel like actually everything that got rid of was the right thing to go and you don't miss it at all? The one thing that kind of got taken out from the you know what I ended up selling when I sold the book, so it was five hundred twenty nine first draft. I got it down to probably four hundred and sixty pages on my own. Like I really think part one was the biggest mess because. I was really trying to figure out the tone of the book. Mm -hmm. So that is where at first I wrote it very formally, you know, kind of like as, uh, you know, an homage to the original. But then I was like, teens don't really talk this way. So it just sounded very uptight to me. So as I hit part two and part three, I kind of hit my stride. And then I had to go back and match it. Basically, yeah. in part one is what I had to do. Um, I had a lot about the parents, you know, because basically I'm the, probably the age of the parents in this book. Like, I mean, I have friends maybe who have teenage, you know, kids right now, like 15 years old. So I was kind of, you know, thinking of my, my own experience and have children, like thinking about it, like, you know, how that would inform them. Like my brother has children and I'm, it's interesting because like I grew up with him to see how he acts as a father, like, you know, how differently he acts from our father, etc. So I always found that sort of side interesting. But then my editors were like, the book is too long. No one cares <laughs> about the parents and their backstories and who they slept with in high school. So yeah, let's cut that out. So we just got rid of a lot of that and that kind of cut out a lot. Um, speaking of the idea of tone, I mean, the, I find the narrative style of Anna Kate is very distinctive. And I think it definitely still has that kind of old novel feel of this omniscient narrator element of like, you know, overviewing the scene and explaining what happened, very kind of um, uh, prose heavy, I guess, in a lot of ways. Um, where did that come from? Like, where did that distinct style come from? Was it inspired by those kind of earlier novels? Was it something that you felt comfortable with in the way you normally wrote prose? What, what was that decision about? It's actually very different from how I normally write. Like before this, I had published two middle grade novels, you know, for third to fifth grade, middle grades in the United States for third graders to fifth graders, you know, basically. Um, and I almost always write voice driven characters, basically like in one person's voice. So me writing, you know, third person was very different because I normally don't do it. So that was me 
trying to do it in the honor of like Tolstoy's book because I like to just you know Tolstoy has this overview when he writes the original of so many different characters I mean people think Anna Kay has a lot of characters the original has so many more there's a part where the Levin character which is Dustin in Anna Kay he you know he we're at with him and you find out what the dog is thinking of him like his own dog like that's how <laughs> intricately he gets in there and so I have a tendency a little bit to do that myself which is it's fun to kind of explore characters but be able to know like their inside thoughts without it being from their point of view because again I think that probably is you know interestingly pointing out uh, a tv thing like you're seeing it I'm seeing it from a removed setting of what I would be able to view but I also have the luxury to write what the character's thinking about at the same time so yeah, um Let's talk a little bit about writing advice because I know that we've got a lot of people who watch these streams who are really interested in writing. Um, how did you put yourself in the shoes of these characters who was all going to be different and similar to you, I guess, in different ways, um, whether that's because of their personality or their experience or their outlooks? Um, was that something you found quite easy and that you find quite easy in writing? Or do you have to kind of really work at the character's backstory and their motivations and stuff to be able to start writing from their point of view? I feel like it was actually pretty easy for me. I think I have a little bit of arrested development myself. I mean, I just don't <laughs> think that I've ever really fully grown up. And I feel like the field that I'm in writing for television, like I wrote, um, you know, early in my writing career for TV writing, I wrote on the Disney Channel show, Shake It Up with like Bella Thorne and Zendaya. So that was their first, I mean, Zendaya's first show. Mm -hmm. So writing for that, we always had to stay like up to date on like, you know, kids speak and lingo. And I've always just loved pop culture. So I'm very interested in it. So I still read, you know, a lot of pop culture references, etc. And so then next I worked on a show called Young and Hungry, which is like on Netflix. And that's a very young 20 something, but a lot of teenagers wrote it. So I think that's just always kind of like where my attention level is. Like those are the things I'm interested in myself. So um, in terms of the love story aspect, though, I am um, married and my second, it's my second husband, but we met in 2014 and I was living in Los Angeles and he was living in Brooklyn, New York. And we met on a book tour for our kids books because he's a kids book author as well. And it was just a very sort of romantic, like kind of, I thought it was a fling, honestly. <laughs> I was like, well, how's it going to work? He's over there. I'm over here. Let's just like hook up, you know, basically at this conference. And then it turned into much more like we were kind of traveling back and forth, but I had this whole experience where I was like, oh, this is teenage love. Like mm -hmm. that thing where you're like, so into the person and you're like, do you know this idea? It's, I call it a puppy shirt that like, basically, you know, when puppies are little, you wear a t-shirt sometimes and then it'll like you and then with the puppy and then it's supposed to comfort them at night. So it's the same idea that like before he would leave, he'd like wear a shirt and I'd ask him to leave it for me and then he would leave. And then I had this shirt that I would sleep in or I kept under my pillow and I was like, oh, that's just like this idea of like where you're super obsessed with someone. So I, had, I was lucky and I had this chance to kind of channel like these feelings that I had had recently into the Anna and Bronski story. So that was fun. Uh, we've had a question from Willow Sweet Oak. Um, actually kind of a two part question. One is, uh, does the place where you sit down to write matter for you? Uh, and also what kind of stuff helps inspiration flow for you when you're writing? I write in a lot of different places around my apartment, basically. I've never been able to really write in a coffee shop because I'm so interested in people watching. So I just tend to not do anything and just stare at everyone, basically. Um, but in my apartment, I really like to write in bed, which isn't like great for your posture. Though I have now <laughs> learned how to prop up pillows and try to keep my shoulders back because I don't know, I just like sitting in bed, basically. And so you know, there was like an art little easel thing called a Daler Rowney that like, I sometimes put on my lap so that my computer's like in the right level, but like I'll write there and then I'll go to, you know, my desk or I'll go to the living room table. I kind of move around a lot, basically. I mean, I probably sit too long. I mean, in one place, which I think is not what you're supposed to do. Um, but in terms of inspiration, 
Anna K, I just really flowed. I mean, I can say on the book I'm writing on now, which we'll discuss in spoiler alert time. Um, it's been a much harder process for me. And in terms of inspiration, like I definitely like I'm watching some old TV shows about teenagers and stuff, trying to like get back into the headspace, especially because of the pandemic. It's just like, it's a different, it's a harder creative process for me lately. Um, I can ask another question from uh, the chat. Hitchhiker Hobbit, an amazing uh, name, by the way. <laughs> um, asks, are there any other old classics that you'd love to be able to retell in a modern setting or was like Anna Karenina it for you? You know, it's funny, as soon as, you know, I sold Anna Karenina, I mean, Anna Kay, my book agent was like, ooh, what are you going to do next? What other book are you going to retell? <laughs> I, I never really thought of it that way. I never, that was never the plan. Like, oh, this is a thing I'm going to try to do. This one was pretty organic for me because of me loving the novel and coming up with the idea like, oh, it would be so great as a modern teen story. So I don't know. I mean, I have thoughts. I mean, I have since thought about it. I mean... I sort of do love the story of um, the Count of Monte Cristo just because I like revenge stories because I think that's just something that drives someone. But I mean, they did that in TV already with that show Revenge like 10 years ago and it was a female character. And so I was like, uh, I don't know. I, I think there are, I actually looked it up. There are a couple Count of Monte Cristo sort of stories. So it's just interesting. Like when I was writing the Anna Kay, I was so worried someone else was doing it because it just hasn't necessarily <laughs> done as a retelling yet. So I think I would probably go more obscure. I mean, there's a couple D.H. Lawrence books that aren't, you know, Sons and Lovers or Women in Love that I would maybe tackle that's like a different type of classic that's not as well read. I mean, I'm very gratified that so many people who liked Anna Kay who haven't read Anna Karenina, I keep seeing like on Instagram that they are now going to read Anna Karenina. So I love that. I mean, I want more people to read the original. That, I mean, that's what's happening in the Discord. A lot of people, I think I mentioned to you when we were in the call earlier, have been like, yeah, I'm going to try. And I think someone was like trying to finish Anna Karenina before this stream. They were like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to read that as well before the stream because they are clearly overachievers. Um, and we love that. Right. Uh, so I want to dive a little bit more into the kind of content of the book itself, skirting around spoilers for now, but we'll, we'll obviously get to spoiler territory in a bit. Um, so you uh, kind of introduce a lot of the other major players before you introduce Anna in the book. There's a lot of other people whose stories we get to know about before Anna even makes an appearance, but even though she's kind of mentioned by everyone and you get a sense of who she is beforehand from other people's um, talking to her. Whereas I think traditionally in novels, you expect, you know, the first person that you see is going to be the person that you follow the whole way through as the lead. Why make that decision? Why did you decide to kind of hold off sort of 20, 30 pages before we actually got to meet the title character of the book. It is very similar to the original Anna Karenina because it really starts off, I mean, the very first scene in all the adaptations in film or TV basically start with the idea of like the cheating, basically her brother's cheating scandal, him badly mishandling it and not knowing what to do, very clueless. And then he writes a letter uh, to his sister and it's like, I need you, I need your help. I'm like in over my head. And so, what I like about it for me is that it's kind of a mysterious thing. I mean, she is the title character. So you're like, who is this person? So to hear everyone's point of view about her is sort of interesting. And also the idea in the beginning, for me at least with Anna Kay, is that she's sort of rarefied and not unknowable, but she just keeps to herself. And that really kind of worked also, I think, how she was raised because in my uh, characterization, she's half Korean and half white. Mm -hmm. And I will say about like, I mean, I'm full Korean, but the, my Korean upbringing is that you really play it close to the vest. Like you're not supposed to show your emotions outwardly in public, et cetera. Like it's just, you stay very reserved. That's how my parents raised me. I am not like that at all. I mean, I'm very like what you see is what you get and loud and mouthy and emotional. But in general, I was supposed to be the other way, <laughs> like a good Korean girl. And I feel like in the beginning with Anna, since she's only 16, she is that good Korean girl. Like she's sort of perfect. Her grades are great. She's always put together. She's all never a hair out of place. And what I love is that when she's ski and like really falls for him he becomes her undoing like she starts taking 
he really just opens her up. And I, I mean, I definitely didn't want to do a thing where it's all about the boy and it's all about a relationship that, you know, but I just think she was already ripe for that time. Like she was already like, oh, holding it together. Cause it's very hard to like put the appearance of being like perfect and like, you know, keeping all so many balls in the air that I think she was just looking for any excuse to just like rebel and break free. So. Yeah. Um, I have a question from Levi. Um, why did you choose to abbreviate most of the family names of the characters? You know, it's an interesting question because um, I really did come up with the title like Anna Kay. I don't know why it just sort of came to me when on that first time when I was thinking about it, right? Mm -hmm. Because obviously I wasn't going to use the name Karenina. And I was <laughs> like, oh, Anna Kay, I'll just do this initial thing. So it could be like, anyone could be Anna Karenina, sort of, right? anyone could be Anna Kay. And then once I did it, I was sticking to it, but I have noticed here and there, I did do last names because that was my problem with Vronsky because Vronsky is technically his last name, but I really, to me, you just need that character. I mean, there was a discussion of do we change Vronsky to a different like Russian sounding name? And I really looked up every other Russian V name and there's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. But there were so many, and I, I don't know, none of them seemed right. And I really wanted, I really love the Count Vronsky too, which is why I came up with the whole nickname. I'm like in high school prep schools, I feel like everyone has a nickname. So like calling him the Count was very funny to me. Um, you know, I tried to put in a little bit of like a sense of humor, like a little quirky sort of thing. So it just became easier. And then I just kind of stuck with it. But when uh, Kimmy goes to her pediatrician, I call him Dr. Becker instead of Dr. B, I realized. But that's because my doctor's Dr. Becker here in Los Angeles. So I was like, oh, and I just left it. So it's a little bit inconsistent. It did feel very kind of, uh, kind of like a gossip girl throwback to like, kind of anonymize these like, very right. well known people, but like with the idea that you know who Anna Kay is, like who else would you be talking about in this elite society? Of course, it's Anna Kay. Um, right. uh, another actually from the chat, we've got uh, Rebecca Charters, another name question. Okay. Is the De La Ro Roni art thing you use the inspiration for the model's names in the book? I wondered why you chose those names. I have those acrylic paints, so it made me laugh. <laughs> that is, exactly completely accurate and why I call those models <laughs> <Amazing. Ryan. laughs> there are so many characters in the book like definitely like my husband's little sister's name is Hannah so Lolly has friends Miley and Hannah someone on Instagram is like oh my gosh you did that because of Hannah Montana and I was like oh actually, <laughs> no, that Hannah was from my my husband's little sister and I wanted to make her a virgin so that when her parents read it <laughs> they would be like, you know, think that that was funny. So a lot of them are kind of insiders. Uh, Dustin's girlfriend at camp is Susie S. And my brother's wife is Susie S. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of putting a little bit of, you know, fun there. And like the babysitter, Devin, is um, one of my husband's cousins, you know. Um, so I just was kind of using names that way. Because that's fun for me. Oh, uh, Tasha and Stephanie who Dustin meets at the New Year's Eve party that tell him, give him the like lowdown about uh, Kimmy. Those are two of my best friends in New York City. Amazing. So I just always kind of throw them in. Um, so the, the book deals with a lot of, I guess, what some people might consider to be like hot issues, hot topics, like uh, n never in a didactic way. Um, but like, I mean, I feel like if I'd listed them all, we'd be in here for the rest of the call, but you're talking about like divorce and mental health issues and drugs and sex and like carrying the weight of parental expectations. And like, there's, there's like so much stuff going on. Was that kind of really intentional to include stuff in there? Or was it just stuff that you saw from the original book and from what teenagers go through? And it just felt like realistic to have those things in there. Like what was your decision-making process? And also how did you make it not turn into one of those you know, and all of these things are bad. Here is a warning story of why you must not do the bad things, kids. Like, what, what's that relationship like in your writing? When I started writing Anna Kay, I knew it would be young adult because, you know, I used to work in book publishing. So I understand that these, these days now there's a young adult category. And if you're writing about teenagers, it just classifies the book as young adult. But I wasn't writing it thinking like, 
this needs to be for written for teenagers. I mean, I think I'm pretty lucky in the United States here. I definitely know there's a lot of crossover, like a lot. I think there are probably just as many women in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who've read Anna Kay as there are teenagers. And I think I've horrified a lot of them who are parents. <laughs> but, um, for me, I really was very adamant that I wanted to write a very clear depiction of teenagers. So I really didn't shy away. I know there is like excessive drug use that, you know, some people think about or sex and like, and it's a little bit graphic at times, but honestly, I really didn't do it for the sake to be salacious. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't the plan. Like to me, I'm very like character specific. So if the character is a certain way, then that's like how they should talk or behave, et cetera. And I, you know, I did not grow up that wealthy, um, you know, in New York City by any means. I had a, you know, we were like, you know, upper middle class in Tennessee. My father was a doctor. So, but in the city, I've seen plenty of rich kids in the city. You see them, like what they wear. And like, I can't even imagine the amount of, you know, clothing allowance that they get. And I know that they just run in a more sophisticated, fast circle. I went to prep school for like one year or two at boarding school. And there's plenty of drugs and sex that's happening. And, you know, it's funny because when I talk to some people, you know, who have teenagers um, themselves and who are well to do, they're like, oh, my child would never do that. And I'm like, bullshit. <laughs> There's no way. I'm sorry. I mean, I'm, I don't think every rich kid's like partying and doing drugs. I'm not saying that ever, but I'm saying in these particular characters, they just run fast. Like they just get bored easier. They've really had more experiences than most teenagers have by being well-traveled and they've been exposed to so much that I think they do, you know, mature in certain areas very quickly, but not emotionally. I do think they are probably emotionally the same as other teenagers, like whether you grew up with, you know, all those, uh, all that privilege, etc. So, you know, when I met, I was lucky enough that there were a lot of different publishers who were interested in Anna Kay. And when I talked to the editors, a lot of them talked about toning down the language or the sex or the drugs. And I really didn't want to, I was like, I really think this is how it should be. I mean, so, I mean, I wasn't super firm on that. I probably softened a little bit here and there, but I just felt like I wanted to make it as realistic in my you know, head as I wanted to. And also I really wanted the book to be fun. I mean, it wasn't supposed to be like as serious as Anna Karenna, the original, because we have that book. Like I wanted it to be like soapy and as much as there is like good and super fun, cool things about being a rich teenager, there are equally bad, terrible things that happen as well. Um, before I go on to the next question, just a reminder to everyone who is watching, uh, if you do have any questions for Jenny that you think of during the stream, please put them in the live chat. Uh, I am, the lo my lovely colleague Simon is writing them all into a document for me here so that I can see them. So I will definitely get around to asking them if you put them in the chat. Um, I guess following on from that, we, we talked to um, Cameron last week who wrote a uh, a novel which also has like sex in it and it's about teenagers and you know that the lead characters are HIV positive Simone and so and she was really really passionate about portraying sex and openly talking about sex as part of the teenage experience in kind of teen novels or YA novels um is that how you feel as well did you feel like you had a responsibility isn't I guess the right word but that you felt like you needed to show those elements of reality that some people might say, oh, I, is it too much for the teenagers? Do they know about sex yet? Was that kind of important to you from that point of view? Or was it more these specific characters you were writing about, it just made sense for them? I think it pretty much what you said, it, it just made sense for the characters. I was conscious though, I think writing for children's television, there is a thing, you know, especially I can only, you know, like the Disney channel about imitable behavior, you know, which is this idea of like, some things we just couldn't do. Like they didn't want food fighting, you know, in a comedic scene because it's a waste of food and people would get upset about it. So there, you know, TV is much more monitored in that mm -hmm. regard, obviously than books. And so I really did think about it. So it was, you know, yes, there's a lot of drug use, but I tried to show like, there's a darker side to drug use as well. And the same thing, like, you know, I can only speak about, uh, you know, the TV in the United States, like, you know, you really rarely see smoke anymore like can smoke etc but like now when they do smoke even in like Mad Men um the show they have to cough you'll notice it like if you see it there has to be like a little bit of a repercussion so anyone who looks all glamorous smoking you do at some point in time have to show them like 
coughing because they want to show like a balance of that side. So I tried to do that as well. And I tried to make it very that like, you know, Kimmy, Lolly, you know, was a, you know, like who was a virgin and then she wanted to wait and everyone expected that she was because she was with Steven, she was like definitely having sex. But I, so I really tried to kind of keep it varied basically um, for the different characters. And Dustin especially is interesting to me because you know, I don't talk about his sex life that much because he's just pining away for Kimmy the entire time. But in my mind, you know, Dustin's definitely a virgin, you know, and again, I feel like they always discuss female virginity, but it's never really discussed, you know, that much on the male side. So I found that interesting. I really tried to make these thoughtful decisions when it came to like sex and drugs. Uh, speaking of Dustin, I've really got a question from Levi. Um, what's the reason for having Dustin be adopted in your book um, as his original character in the Anna Karenina isn't. You know, Dustin was sort of an interesting character. Um, I named him Dustin because um, my ex-boyfriend's uh, son is named Dustin. And I lived with Dustin when he was like age five to age 12 before like we broke up and whatnot. I'm still actually very good friends with Dustin who's now, you know, a uh, uh, junior Julian. So he's in college right now. So I got to see him grow up. And so it's interesting. So I don't know, I have a very, you know, affectionate, you know, over this kid. And so when I was trying to decide about, I definitely do have issues about like race because I was very conscious, made a decision of Anna Kay being half Korean. My brother um, married, I call her a blonde. I was like, it's a white woman. I, I was like, my brother married a blonde basically. And so his three children are, you know, mixed race. And he told me, this was, you know, 10 years ago. He's like, I want you to write books with characters that are like, you know, mixed race because I don't think there's enough representation for my kids to see because they just happen to live in an area that's very all white basically so they just don't see themselves represented and reflected and I think Disney Channel is very good about doing that I learned that a little bit there which is they don't necessarily we didn't talk about race but you'll see in a lot of their shows it's very multicultural and it's just not commented on it because I didn't want to necessarily this book isn't about race to me but I want it you know, when it's character specific, it needs to be that way. So with Dustin, um, I wanted to make him Jewish. My husband's, uh, one of his closest friends in Brooklyn is half, you know, is half black and he's Jewish as well. The adopted part, I don't know why I did that necessarily, except that I wanted him to be the ultimate outsider. And I think that there's a lot of feelings when you're adopted, because I have friends who have adopted siblings, that there is a little bit like you're that more removed so for me Dustin's sort of the heart and the moral center of the book so that he's kind of a little bit of the observer and you know I wanted him to feel very like outside as he slowly he's the one who gets slowly brought into the world and in the beginning he's very like dismissive of it like it's very easy to say that all rich people are terrible or all you know they're all one thing until you kind of meet some and really get to know them because and this didn't totally work in the book, but this was my attempt. I feel like in the beginning, there's a lot of name dropping and labels and designer names and stuff um, that the characters are wearing. Because I feel like there's a perception that when you see someone or a teenager, you're kind of looking like what they look like, what designers they wear, and you just make judgments based on that. But as you get to know all the characters as people, I kind of dropped that out. I don't know if people noticed or not, but I definitely just didn't mention as much later on in the book because Stephen especially, like when you meet him, he's the most entitled and like kind of bratty sort of kid. But, you know, I really tried to give each of the characters a character arc and get to know them and kind of dig deep. Uh, another question for Joanna. Are there any characters that you would have liked to focus on more or perhaps could imagine a spin-off story about? Spin-off story. Well, I mean, I don't, um, I don't know if it's a spoiler. I'm going to say that I am working on a sequel. So there will be, <laughs> so yay. Um, and so yes, we are going to hear more from all of these characters. To me, Whenever you think of movies of Anna Karenina, I don't know if any of them were ever super successful in my opinion. Like I love some of them, but it's not, everyone always focuses on the Anna and Bronsky story. That's like all anyone cares about. It's the doomed romance, etc. But to me in the original novel, you sort of need all the different love stories 
to make it work. Like that's what made their story so interesting because you got to see a story of like, you know, Dustin pining for Kimmy. And then you got to see Lolly and Steven who are already in love, but having problems. Like you kind of need a wide, you know, lens to be able to capture it all in. And to me, that's what elevates the story of Anna Vronsky. Like if you look at the original, the Anna and the Anna Karenina part is probably definitely not, I mean, there's, it's not as that as much as you would think in that storyline. She is not the dominant, they are not the dominant relationship in the main book. Um, question from Levi. What did you mean uh, with a life without love isn't a life at all? Is that something you believe or is it just a character's view? I think that was really sort of a character's view. I mean, I think that's just one of these ideas that it really does enhance, you know, your life and I think you know obviously when you're young and stuff and you haven't been in love yet it seems like this big thing I'm just saying it really adds a certain sort of value I mean when you know going back to when we we're talking about sex I'm in no way pre preaching or saying I talk experiences is uh you know in high school I was a fairly you know you know sexually active I think in high school basically far younger than I was probably ready for but I had a lot of sex before without like being necessarily in love, I think. And I really do think there was a difference for me. I can only talk about myself, but I think that that has like really enriched sort of like my life. I think I personally have always been very ambitious and like always was about career first over relationships. And I never really had great balance. You know, I've definitely had fallen in love here and there, but I just, I don't know, it was very hard to like juggle all of that for me. So, but you know, I think the older I've gotten, the more I've understood like how much it adds value to every area of your life, basically. Um, just before we get into the spoiler section, I wanna talk a little bit about kind of like inspiration in general for you. Um, okay. What authors kind of inspire you or other writers outside of novels, whether that's within the land of TV and film or, or anything like that? Who, who are people that you really get inspired by? Um, my, some of my favorite authors, I, I really love short stories. So I really, Laurie Moore is probably one of my favorite all time writers, basically. Um, I probably do read more women than men. Um, I'm right now reading Infinite Jest, uh, by David Foster Wallace. It's my husband's like favorite book. And <laughs> I read it once, um, probably four years ago when we first started dating because I was like, oh, it's his favorite book. And I, <laughs> I've never read it, I'm to read it. And I, at the beginning, I was like, oh my gosh, it's so long. There's so many characters. And then it kind of like picked up for me and then I really enjoyed it. But um, I'm actually reading it during the pandemic as a buddy read with Dustin, the, the Dustin of, in my mm -hmm. life, because he had never read it. So we're reading a hundred pages at a time. So we're like, I'm in the 800s right now. So that's what I love about him and I'm ex is just like how detailed he gets into his characters which I like I mean I'm very detail specific you know I put like I just I don't know I, to me that's what I need kind of to like really get in um I love uh David Mitchell um I just got his new novel I can't wait to read it but I have to finish what I'm writing on now I'm on deadline before I can kind of start that but I love the bone clocks I think Anna is actually reading the bone clocks in a section of the book, because I wanted to make Anna a big reader. Um, I just love the worlds that he creates and how he structures things. Um, I loved, let's see, what else? I, you know, young adult books, I read like, I've read the ones that kind of came out, like that just grew big, like obviously The Fault of Our Stars and The Hunger Games and, you know, any of the books that kind of like went, crossed over and became like, you know, big, sort of hits I knew. Now that I'm a young adult author, I have been trying to explore and read more. Like, I, I don't think I realized how deep and how expansive the world is in young adult literature. So it's been really fun for me to learn about. I keep looking that way because my dog is walking back and forth in the apartment. My cat has just been on a chair in the corner the entire time, normally to be meowing. So I'm like, she's doing well. She's, uh, she's behaving for the live stream. Yeah. Um, just for everyone on the uh, live stream chat, um, although, as I said, we're about to go into spoilers in a second, um, if you have any questions, you can keep asking them in the chat. I'll come back to them, even if they aren't technically a spoiler question. Don't worry about that. Um, you can still leave them. Um, so one thing I wanted to ask, actually, before the spoiler section, um, can you talk about the adaptation? Is there anything you can say about it? Are you allowed? Oh, the TV. Um... 
I am a TV writer and like, you know, when I was writing it, I did have an eye, you know, you know, thinking about like this to me would be a great TV show, <laughs> basically. And that was always sort of the plan too, which is sell it as a novel. I always wanted to write the story as a novel first, but the idea was to like definitely do an adaptation. Um, I was lucky enough that we sold it to uh, HBO Max. So it's in development. And I, I mean, I don't really have any other details besides that because things just can be in development. Like I have a couple different TV projects I'm working on right now. I'm doing, you know, a vampire kid show that's based on books that I haven't read. I'm doing a comedy with uh, Margaret Cho, um, the comedian who I love. Um, but it's fun. In Hollywood or in TV writing, you have to think there's so many people writing different shows that never make it onto the air. Like it's just the process. So for me, I have to have a lot of irons in the fire. Obviously my dream show to do, Anna Kay is a TV show and the it would be that the first season is the entire book. Like I see it as 10 episodes, one hour drama, like in the vein of, you know, when we sold it, I described it as sort of, you know, the crown, you know, everyone's like crazy rich Asian meets gossip girls. But I love also like the richness of the crown. Like we were trying to sell it, you know, we sold it as a premium, you know, young adult show, like lavish sets, big costume budget. Like it would just be so fun to me. So that's, you know, we're just like in the process. There's a lot of people involved in writing TV. There just are. There's like executive producers and there's a studio and there's, you know, then and there's the network. So there's just so many channels. So it's very slow and it's a very big group process. Like any little thing I write gets notes from like my producers, then I have to rewrite it. Then it goes to a studio, then they give notes and I have to rewrite it. Like, you know, it's a very involved process because it's a lot of money <laughs> for writing you know for producing a tv show amazing sweet so we are now warning for everyone watching going into the spoiler section so if you have not finished the book pause the video now come back later i'm gonna give you two seconds okay <laughs> now that they're all gone okay. oh the ending jenny re did you did you need to attack us in this way. It's it's really funny because everyone, like the people who have been commenting on it and, and people have been tweeting and using the hashtag where I think no, none of them was expecting it. Even, it kind of the, even the people who had read Anna Karenina or were familiar with the ending kind of assumed that it wouldn't happen or like nothing, nothing uh, kind of the, the, there wouldn't be any deaths in it. Um, why, like, why did you decide to keep his death in and also why did you decide to not keep hers in like what was that decision making process like for you was that something you knew really early on in the process or was there a different kind of thoughts in your head about it I guess I'll talk about the original first my original issue with the anachron I mean and what makes it great is that it is a doomed love story and it is a tragedy and I feel like Tolstoy who basically is the Levin character in the book his viewpoints about women or in societies that she made one mistake, basically. I mean, she did cheat on her husband, absolutely. And she continued to do so. But to him, it's like an irreversible mistake. I mean, Anna just meets a terrible end. Even though she gets to be with Vronsky, she loses her children. She, she like basically becomes like a drug addict. I mean, she gets addicted to morphine and she just gets very jealous and crazy. And I just felt so terrible for her like it's just such a terrible thing that one mistake can cost you like everything basically it cost her her life and so that's why it's such a tragedy I always knew that I would give Anna a different ending I just knew it I just didn't want the book to be like that especially as a teenager I felt like that would be so terribly tragic like almost too much so that like as a teenager that you think you can make a mistake or you know and people find out about you and that you just don't want to live anymore you know you're gonna toss your life or you felt like you had no other options but to do this so that was definitely like not in any way like a message that I thought I wanted to say for young girls or teenagers or anyone really I mean it's just not the case I mean like I've said I have continually made plenty of mistakes as I've gotten you know through the years and I've rebounded from all of them so it's totally fine um I did believe very that someone needed to die I mean to make it this like romantic love story because the, the joke is you know with Romeo and Juliet like if they both had lived how long would their relationship have really lasted you know especially like when you're a teenager like yes 
I actually know someone who like met in at 14 and they're still together now, you know, but in general, that's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, you know, that like kind of froze them in Amber, that relationship in time, like he can be her greatest love she's ever had because he died, which is like an unfortunate. And I just felt like also with the train, you just needed someone to die by train, I guess. So that was why. And then, so I don't think I knew for sure that he was going to die by train, but I definitely knew she was not. But I, I, you know, as I kept writing, I'm like, oh, someone needs to do it. But to me, I did change it. It wasn't that he died out of despair or that he killed himself. He was doing it for love. He was trying to save her life. So was it a surprise for you, Rowan, when you read it? Of, yeah, I don't know what I was expecting because I think it's, Ending. it's whether it's, it's so sudden in a lot of ways. Also not because, yeah, you're right with the train. There's always that element of like, oh God, the train. <laughs> like, I, I kind of know maybe where this is going in this scene where there is a train. And it, you have him like almost, and then go back and then almost, like it's such a, it's such a tense scene to what, to, to read. I said to watch, cause it is like, I, I, I was there. I was like, I can see this subway platform. Like I can see everything happening. I kind of know I'm like camera angles in my head. Um, and one of the things that's so like gutting about it is it's not even a new uh, like part or a new chapter, a new page. It's literally the same page. And it's just like, so they went to the funeral and you're like, oh God, he's, okay, he's dead, <laughs> like, Jesus. And it, like, I kind of wanted to ask you about that. Like, what was that decision to have that kind of time skip and to have that really jarring, like emotionally, like, oh God, kind of moment of he's, his, his hand slips and then we're, we're going past everything. We never, we don't see her on the platform react. We don't see what happens afterwards. We kind of just see her dealing with it afterwards. What, why did you make that decision? Where, where was that kind of process from? I just feel like that would have been such a horrific sort of thing to see. And beside her dad, her calling, you know, her father coming and whatnot for her, that it's just like such a unspeakable, terrible thing that you, you know, you just needed to move. I needed to move past it. It's funny, the original ending that I had was Kimmy and... Um, Dustin at prom dancing and then it just ended. I didn't do that later scene where Anna goes back to the train station and with the idea that possibly she was going to go join him. But I felt like when I finished it, I was like, yay, I'm done. I should be happy. But I just like, I don't know. I was like, this can't be it. I mean, that is sort of more how the original ends. I mean, I think Anna Karenina's eight parts. I'm pretty sure that Anna dies in seven. I think there's a whole huge section, you know, in the original book that keeps going on with Levin and Kitty at the time and him learning about love, et cetera. And like, you know, just discussing it, but I don't know, it just didn't sit right for me. And I was like, I needed to revisit. And then I was like, oh, I do want to see the aftermath and like what it's going to do to Anna. And I do think when you're young, when you suffer such a tremendous like tragedy or loss that she would be overly, you know, upset about it and, you know, emotional and maybe think about doing something like you know dangerous for herself too like it is a romantic notion to join your lover in the afterlife that like you cannot survive without him so when she went down there you know I can't really say why I knew that Natalia should be there and that that she would have this one conversation that would turn her mind because to me it's all about everyone having a different perspective that sometimes it's so hard when you're in like a tragedy or you're in like an impossible situation or you're in something dramatic with your friends, you cannot get outside of your own self yeah. to see it, your own view. It's very hard. I think it, it's hard, hard for me as this. And I think it would be especially hard when you're a teenager because you can only, you're so caught up in your own drama. So I really felt like she needed an outside force to explain, like to show her like, Yes, this is an unspeakable tragedy, but in a way it's kind of cool. You had this guy who loved you so much. He saved your life. Like how romantic is that? You know, I really wanted to make sure that like, you know, I had another voice. And so it just seemed kind of apropos. I didn't name Natalia. Like, I mean, so it was Natalia for sure, but I just, we decided to take her name out of it. So it wasn't exactly clear. So it was just sort of this mysterious person and she had no idea you know, in, in one version, I'm saying that Anna knew, kind of figured it out that it was Natalia and then, but didn't comment on it. But then we're decided to like keep her a mystery that she had no idea who it was. So it would seem like kind of this extra little ending. I really like the, I really like the, I mean, I say liked, 
I was very emotionally gutted by the necklace charm by like the that kind of experience yeah. at the end was like because I mean not to not to name drop more Russian writers but the sort of Chekhov's gun element of when you have like a symbol or like an object or a motif that comes through and I kind of felt like oh the the use of that later on is when he goes back for it on the train tracks and then to have it come back again in this slightly different form in this like forever changed like Anna has been by the situation that was I thought was a really really beautiful ending um Thanks. speaking of ending we are at the end of the live stream already it's flown by um I've got one more question for you um okay. end on um so uh I've got a quote from a, a Goodreads review actually of someone who really loved the book but had that experience that we talked about before of being someone who kind of didn't, wasn't familiar necessarily with Anna Karenina and kind of just went into it assuming that uh, they said, I thought this would surely be a breezy romantic read centering on rich elite teens and an illicit love affair, which would end in momentary sadness, but then ultimately a happy ending. So there was like kind of expectation of like the rom-com thing of, you know, they get together, then something breaks them apart for a minute, but then they're back together again. I kind of wanted to ask you, what has the general reception to the book been, been like for you? Like how have people received it? What have you heard from readers who either have read Anna Karenina and are coming from that angle or have never read it before in a maybe getting into the book um, afterwards. What's that been like for you? I get a lot of questions where people are like, should I read the book first? Like on Instagram, Anna Karenina first, or should I, what order? Now, honestly, I think it works both ways mm -hmm. because if you have read Anna Karenina, it's kind of fun to see the little things like, you know, Vronsky's horse that he races, Fru Fru is the same name of the horse, you know, in the original. So I did little Easter eggs throughout. So I think that was, you know, on purpose. And I think it can go either way. Um, I think the reception has been pretty good. I mean, I, I'm happy with it. My father, I mean, I think we're in the fourth printing. I think the reception has been very positive. Um, it, it's funny, I, I'm like very chill about reviews. I mean, this is actually like, you know, my seventh book. I've written some like nonfiction, like humor essays, and this is my most well received some terrible reviews about other things. And at first, obviously, as a young writer, it kind of hurt my feelings, etc. But it does just this doesn't anymore because I know how I'm such a huge reader myself. And there's plenty of books that everybody loves that I'm like, eh, meh, like it just didn't do it for me. So I just, you know, I'm thrilled for the people who love it. And the people, you know, I had someone who was like, I read that first sentence with a swear word and I was out and I hated everybody. And, you know, the one thing that I wish is that in a little bit in part one, I think I did lose some people in part one because they found everyone very unlikable. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, if they would have given it a chance, you really do get to know these people. Like it, that was sort of on purpose. Like you, again, you didn't really get to know them that well. So that was like a big thing for me. But in general, I feel like it was very positive. I had, there was never supposed to be a sequel. I mean, it was just like, that was for me, it was one and done. It was never going to be a series, but the sales team at, you know, Flatiron said that everything was very positive. The response was very big. So they asked if I wanted to do a sequel and I agreed. So that is, I'm literally finishing the editing of the sequel right now. So. Uh, and we actually had a message from Rachel in the, I'm um, sorry, Rebecca in the chat. Uh, really looking forward to the sequel. So clearly people in the chat are excited as well. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Jenny. Um, and thank you everyone who has been um, asking questions both on the internet and in the live stream. It's been absolutely wonderful to speak to you. Um, thank you, Rowan. Thank you, Simon. Even though I never met you or saw you, <laughs> thanks for helping me out. I really appreciate everyone. So thanks for joining me. Um, so for everyone who is still watching, um, we are going to be back next week on Sunday with our fourth author, um, the final for this book club that we initially set up, but very excitingly we are, fingers crossed, going to be continuing on a monthly basis. So if you have any thoughts about authors that you would love to see on the stream, that you'd love to get the chance to ask questions to, then please, please um, let us know in the comments of this video. Uh, so next week it is Kat Ellis, who has written Harrow Lake, which is a YA horror about a girl with a, uh, whose father is a famous horror film director. Uh, and after he is attacked in their apartment, she is sent to live in the town where his most famous film is set and some creepy things happen. So very excited to read that next week alongside everyone. Um, all the information to get involved, again, is in the description of this video. So uh, hopefully we will see you guys next week um, and have a wonderful, uh, have a wonderful week of reading.